through the kitchen into that lit hallway and on the left hand side. Uh, San Diego JavaScript is governed by a code of conduct. Uh, all of our details are on sandiegojs.org if you want to read them. But basically it just says be professional and be nice. This is a professional event. There are all of the San Diego JavaScript organizers are here tonight. Myself, Stuart, is up front with the live stream. And Todd is over there. And I don't see Michael. Michael might be in the kitchen. He's around. Um, Michael works here at Zito, so he'll come up and talk about Zito, I'm sure, at the end of the event. Um, these are our upcoming JavaScript events. We have a number meetup also with Nathan Hammond, who is the main speaker for this evening. Um, he'll be speaking at our Ember meetup at SD Learn in North Park on Thursday. Uh, there's a full stack JavaScript meetup. Uh, next Thursday, uh, the React group, which um, is separate from SDJS, but also obviously JavaScript related, they have been rebooted. So they kind of tried to do their thing um, maybe like last year and kind of didn't do it. And so someone else has taken over the group. So if you're into React, I would highly recommend going and checking that out. That's me. Oh, it's you. Okay. <laughs> there you go. You rebooted it. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, ask him if you want to know more about the React group, I guess. Uh, and then there's a BYOP, which is our Bring Your Own Project Night. That is at Dev Boot Camp on Tuesday, August 16th. And then Node.js Social Hour is a nice Node Hangout at Zesty Downtown on Thursday. A lot of events. Um, we're always looking for speakers. We usually do five-minute lightning talks. Tonight we have a special guest um, from LinkedIn as well as a lightning talk. Um, from LinkedIn up in San Francisco, but we're always looking for talks. So if you've never given a talk before, five-minute lightning talks are a really great way to get started. Um, it's not a lot of time commitment to put into creating your content, um, and it's nice and quick and over with. Um, so if you're nervous or something, it's great. And then we stream and record all of the videos, so you can go back and look at it later and be like, oh, I spoke really fast. I can slow down now. Um, if you're interested in giving a talk or trying it out, come and talk to one of the organizers at the end of the event. Otherwise, check out this URL. Um, if you don't want to talk to us right now on your phone, you can just go fill it out, and it'll put you in the queue, and one of us will email you and get you on our event list. Tonight, we're going to have Sunny Dac Daco? Daco. Daco speaking. She's going to be giving a lightning talk, but since there's no other lightning talks, we're just going to let her give her talk. We're not going to do the normal timing that we do, um, and that's on Chrome, Chrome Dev Kit Pro Tips. And then we're going to have Nathan Hammond. Um, like I said, he's here from San Francisco, and he's from LinkedIn, and he's going to be talking about single page routing. And that's it. So I'm going to let Sunny get set up here. Hello, everyone. My name is Sunny Datko, a difficult last name to pronounce. Um, and I'm here to talk about Chrome's Developer Toolkit, a set of tools built into Chrome that lets you access the internals of your browser and website or application. Here's a look at the project we'll be using for this demo. We can just click and drag. Oops. I have a mouse for this. Thank you, Heather. So we can click and drag this into Chrome to get started. It's just a really simple one-page site with a little animation on the image hover. So to open our Chrome uh, Developer Toolkit, we can just right-click anywhere in the screen and hit Inspect. And this will open up the Elements tab of our toolkit. All right, so who here has gone through the cycle where they go to their code editor, make some changes, open it in the browser, look how it looks, go back to your editor, make some more changes, refresh it in the browser, and go back and forth to repeat this process a few times. Anyone? Yeah? Totally. <laughs> this can be a pain point in development. Um, and Chrome actually lets you use the developer toolkit as a live editor. So you can actually make the changes in Chrome and then save those changes directly to disk. So I'm gonna show you how that's done. First thing we wanna do is here under the Sources tab,
just add the root, uh, add the root of your folder here in the left pane. And you'll need to allow the toolkit access to this file. So I'm just going to hit allow up here at the top. And you can see it's been added down here in my Explorer window. If you right click on any one of these files and hit map to network resource, it'll give you an option to map the local file in your browser to the local file on your computer. So here it gives the option for the CSS file. So now that these two files are mapped, we can make changes live in Chrome and it will reflect those changes in our local file. So if we take a look here at our scripts, and this is just a really simple script for demo purposes. If we were to make some changes and comment these out and then open this up in our editor, oh, we have to save the changes for back and undo these changes. You can see it's already edited, it's already updated in our local file. And what's really cool about this feature is that if your CSS files are mapped, you can actually make changes here in the elements panel. So if I were to go in and maybe take our H1 and bump up the size a bit to like 6 EM, when I go to my scripts file, I mean, not my scripts, when I go to my CSS file here, you can see H1 has been changed to 6 EM. And if I were to bump that back down, you see those changes are updated in real time. So you don't need to go back and forth from your browser to your editor, from your browser to your editor. You can actually use Chrome as a built-in live editor. Um, and normally when people see workspaces for the first time, there's usually a couple questions about undoing. Um, I think the elements panel lets you kind of play fast and loose with editing. Um, so it's easy to make a lot of changes and then be like, oh, shoot. So Chrome actually has really um, astounding undo support. I can go here, make some changes, go over to my sources tab, because I'm tight make some changes here, and then go back to my elements panel. And if I just hit uh, Command Z, it still remembers the changes that I made and will undo them. And if I go back here to the sources tab, it'll still undo those. So it does. it is tied to whichever panel you're on at the time. Um, so if you're in the elements panel, you need to be on the elements panel to undo those changes. Um, and uh, just a couple other quick goodies. I discovered this one earlier this week. Oftentimes in the sources tab, I found myself spending a lot of time looking for particular files in the tree. And I discovered you can actually hit Command O and just search for files. So if I wanted to look for styles, I could go right to it. And if you want to find the place where this is in your tree, you can go to Reveal and Navigator and it'll take you right there. Gesundheit. Um, and that's it. That's my talk. This is a microphone. Wow. <coughs> I pick on somebody in the front row of the audience and then uh, proceed to talk, but I'm not very good at any of that, so we're instead we're going to start focusing on the technology things because that's kind of where I, uh, that's my wheelhouse. So, uh, tonight we're going to talk about a library called Route Recognizer, uh, but we're going to talk about it in the most uh, intimate possible details. And if you've actually done uh, crazy things like look at 
uh, my description or bio on the internet, it says Ember, and I have to say Ember uh, at least one more time. Ember. Um, it was a rule. I had to say it three times. So, uh, but that'll probably be it for this evening. So in spite of the fact that this is underpinning a lot of things in Ember, uh, we are not actually uh, going to talk about Ember. So uh, we're going to talk about Route Recognizer. And Route Recognizer is a foundation on which you are able to actually build a URL parser and a URL recognition tool. So this is like your foundation. What you want is uh, a way to investigate, a, your way to boot up your uh, single page application and say, this is what I need to render. Uh, but foundations are important, uh, otherwise you end up with things like this, uh, or if you happen to be paying attention to the news in San Francisco, the new uh, like $350 million tower, or $350 million tower is now 16 inches below ground. Uh, and continuing, and it's also starting to lean. Uh, so foundations are important. We don't really want to uh, mess that up as we're going through. Otherwise, we end up with things like this. Uh, and that's not a happy situation. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about really, 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 really low-level tech stuff this evening. Uh, but it's actually, <laughs> it's not magic. It's pretty straightforward. And so, just quick show of hands, how many of you dropped out of college like me? All right, so uh, all of y'all have approximately the same experience I do. And so in spite of the fact that I'm getting ready to shout computer science terms in your uh, eardrums and just kind of rattle on about it, it's actually not that complicated. So. All you need is a bit of data. Uh, what we're trying to do is serialize a URL. We're going to take something from the URL and render something on the screen. Well, how do you know what to do? Well, turns out we just need some data. And so maybe that data looks a little bit like this. Here's a giant JSON object. It's a serialization of some information. You can start to squint at it a little bit and it looks a little bit like a URL. And so we could actually come up with a really, really simple URL system. Uh, we can just take this and shove it into the URL using some really simple JSON. Because it turns out that uh, JavaScript is a really awesome language and it ships with a serializer and a deserializer. What's a serializer? Well, a serializer is nothing more than JSON.stringify. And a deserializer is nothing more than JSON.parse because that's all there is to it. It's a big fancy word. Uh, stringify is a lot safer of a word, don't you think? So uh, when we're taking a URL, our goal is to actually serialize it into, or serialize a whole bunch of information and shove it into the URL so that later we can play it back. And so this is the simplest possible version. Uh, but that's actually a really terrible user experience. In fact, if you're looking at that URL, you're like, wow, uh, somebody really screwed up. So we want something that looks a little better, uh, something that looks a little bit more like this, a little bit more like the URLs you're expecting, a little bit more like the URLs that Google wants, and a little bit more uh, user-friendly. So let's say you were to actually uh, want to have your users be able to modify the URL and guess what happens. Well, this one you could actually succeed at that. The other one, not so much. And so if you look at this, you can actually sort of see all of the same information that was in that original JSON object, this one. Uh, and we can say, yeah, it looks like it's mostly there. So much so that we can look at it and go, I bet you I can imagine a simple algorithm. Ooh, $4 word. Uh, that we can actually use to go through this process and end up with a result. So we would say, maybe look at it, pay close attention and be like, hmm, well maybe everything gets that name application thing first. Sure. And then after that, we want uh, name users because that's there, seems good. And it looks a little bit like that. So we see everything is application and then we've got users over there. 
And then we've got this uh, last one, which is this user ID field. And we start to run into problems. Uh, we're now in a situation where the actual user ID, how did I know that I was going to set that next value, Nathan Hammond, to user ID? I didn't. There's not enough information stored just inside of the URL to actually process and item potently go in and out of the serialized state to a deserialized state. And so we want to have more information, which means we don't need just data and a user interface for our URLs. We actually need custom serialization and custom deserialization. So, all right, these multi-syllabic words again. Serialization, turns out, is this relatively straightforward process. We know a whole bunch of information. It's sitting in our program's memory, and we can take it, collapse it down, and shove it into a um, string. And if we've got a nice, simple string, this serialization is easy. And so we can do something that looks like this. And if we had all of this in our, our, that original object in memory, this serialization function is all it takes to serialize. So it's actually a very, very straightforward process uh, because you end up with, here's your stuff in memory, and here is the serialized format that we want. And so we can just go from the full fidelity information in memory to the lossy version that is actually a string. And that's where things get complicated. So deserialization. What we want to do is we want to actually uh, go through a URL and turn it back into that JSON object. We saw that our manual process didn't work entirely because we had information that was present, but it was not stored inside of the URL, which means that we actually need to store it in the thing that is responsible for doing the deserialization. Say, maybe route recognizer. Um, so amusingly, deserialization, though uh, it's about 90% of the effort of the actual library, is actually only about, uh, used about once in every single application. So we're gonna talk a little bit about regular expressions. So the obvious solution when you've got a URL and you're like, I know what I'm gonna do. You pull up your XKCD comic and you're like, Yes, I'm going to use regular expressions. And then you've got two problems. Because um, now you have the original problem and now you've got regular expressions. But not only that, the uh, next thing is you can imagine how to build it though. So when you're looking at a URL, we have three types of segments that we're actually talking about. So we've got a static string that appears in there, like slash users. Then we've got a dynamic string that would appear in it, like slash Nathan Hammond. Then we also have this other thing called uh, glob segments. How many of you have written Rails before? At all? A few of you. So globbing segments give you the opportunity to say, hey, just take the next whatever and we'll figure it out. Uh, that's an opportunity to just be like, take all of this and feed it into application code. And so these are the three types of pieces that we want to provide inside of any route recognition library. And if you look at it, you're like, okay, so anytime I actually have a static segment, it's literally just the value. You're like, okay, this is gonna be a really simple regular expression. And then you've got the dynamic segments and turns out the only rule that th makes it actually a dynamic segment is that it stops the first time it sees a slash and it must match at least one character. That's what that, fancy little bit of regular expression gobbledygook is. And then finally, the last one is uh, the, I just want to have all of this please. And this is the Nathan at Thanksgiving. Um, and the globbing segments just consume all of the rest of the values in that actual URL. And so if you were trying to build a route recognition library on top of this, you would go through and you'd say, hey, I have this URL and it's called users slash colon Nathan Hammond, which, or excuse me, users slash colon user ID, which would say, hey, 
I have a URL and there's a dynamic segment called user ID and I want to parse that into a JSON object. So I would literally iterate over all of my possible regular expressions from the first one to the last one until I found a match. And the first time I found a match, I'd stop. And after I stopped, I'd select that route and that'd be the one I'd render. So that one would say slash user slash Nathan Hammond. Great. And now, because I actually have it saved off as a variable in an array, I can say, okay, this is the URL here. And you'll notice that these globbing sections and these uh, dynamic segments are actually capturing. So I can say, okay, here's the contents from that area, and I can assign it to a particular value. And so I'll be able to map a particular back reference to a particular regular expression value. But that has problems. Turns out JavaScript is slow. Uh, that's probably a dangerous position to take while uh, standing in front of the San Diego JavaScript meetup group. And JavaScript is slow. And uh, worse than JavaScript being slow, JavaScript runs on devices that look like this. And these devices are also slow. So it compounds. So what we really need to do is not iterate over every single regular expression. Let's say you had, uh, say, 500 routes in your application, and you were going to iterate over them. That means you've got to compile 500 regular expressions. And if you have to compile 500 regular expressions and execute 500 regular expressions, um, you would probably be just as tired as a JavaScript interpreter as you are hearing me say 500 expressions. So. We have a radix or a prefix tree, which is a magic data structure uh, that all of you know how to use and know how it works. How many of you have ever seen a phone book? All right, all of you that are under the age of... <laughs> <laughs> I get it, I get it, we're getting old. All right, so, uh, if you look at a phone book and you're thinking about it, you don't actually go through and be like, you know what, I'm going to do a binary search over a phone book. <laughs> you don't open the phone book halfway and say, hmm, is L before or after M? Uh, in fact, you jump directly to that portion of the page. So a radix or a prefix tree is a lookup thing. It's actually tree here is not misspelled. It is a retrieval tree. And so if you're thinking about it, you're indexing into a phone book, you go to the first letter, and then you go to the second letter, and then you go to the third letter. And so let's say my last name is Hammond. I go to H, and then I go to the page that is HA, and then I go to the uh, section that is HAM, and then I eventually have sorted through all of it, but I only ever looked for the particular thing that I was looking for. And so that's a radix or a prefix tree. And that might look a little bit like this if you had a URL map. So if you think about it, URLs have this nice, clean structure generally where you have, unless we do our JSON serialization approach, which eh, I think we'll stick with the uh, slashes. I think they look good. Uh, so we have this users tree here, and then we have this posts tree. Let's say I wanted to go actually find the uh, users edit thing. I'm actually just going to go look for slash users in one pass and then slash edit in another pass. I don't want to actually go through and like iterate over all of them. I can just say go to users edit. I know what the keys are so I can directly look it up. And so that code might look a little bit like this. We don't have to traverse the entire tree that you just saw. In fact, if you pay really close attention here, we actually only go through the segments that are actively touched uh, for that route. So in this case, we go through each of the segments, and if it uh, doesn't have the child node that we're looking for, uh, we throw an error. Otherwise, we jump directly to it, and then we keep going. So we pop off the first segment, and it says slash users. Great. And we uh, take it and shove it on, and we go, okay, I know what that first segment is. Then I'm going to grab the next one. 
I didn't iterate through all of the segments at any level. I directly addressed it right here on line 11. Uh, that makes it incredibly performant. But magically underneath the hood, I kind of painted us into a little corner. Uh, there are a little few sneaky constraints that snuck in there. If I actually had a URL and I'm trying to do like slash users slash whatever, what happens when you have a dynamic segment? I don't have a way to directly address that because there's nothing that says slash user slash Nathan Hammond in that route map. It's actually slash user slash colon user ID. That's not very good. And then uh, we also have made it to where routes must match at segment boundaries. Most people probably don't care about that, but that's something that is now a constraint if we actually go with that prefix tree approach. And then beyond that, uh, how do you even support a glob segment? I don't even know where to start or stop anything. Uh, that's not a good situation. So there's this other magical computer science thing called a non-deterministic finite automata. It gets worse. <laughs> so a non-deterministic finite automata, or NFA, uh, from this point forward, uh, is actually just a linked list. I told you. Uh, <laughs> all of you are going to be fully prepared for your next interview questions. Um, <laughs> So if we had a route that was just slash users slash new, and we have down beneath it an exploded version of it, it looks a lot like the same way we would index into that phone book. So what we have here is this uh, like slash, and then the next thing is a U. So if I knew uh, and consumed a URL one character at a time, like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, because um, apparently Tyrannosaurus Rex eat with their hands. Um, we're going to actually enhance a little bit here. I'm actually not labeling the node. When we look at this explosion here, it's not a linked list of each of these characters. It is actually a list of a whole bunch of states. And on the arrow is actually the label. So. Uh, we've gone into mid-90s uh, crime television here, Enhance. And so we see that each of these nodes actually has its own information attached to it. Uh, those are those really nice JSON objects down at the very bottom there. Uh, and what we know is, oh, this one is the root. And then this one, uh, if I happen to see a U as the first character, I end up here. And I can do that all the way through. So let's imagine adding more routes. So how many of you play StarCraft? Um, so uh, let's add more routes into this. We have slash users slash new. And then we can also do this thing where users branches off on line two. And we see that we have uh, slash users slash edit. And what we've done is we've collapsed the number of options and the number of states that we needed by using the prefixing ability, which is very similar to a radix or prefix tree, but this is actually still an NFA. So the thing that makes an NFA interesting is that it actually is a set of options instead of a tree traversal. So when you're looking up my name, H-A-M, through your phone book, you're eventually going to get to like Hammond, and then there are gonna be like four other Nathans because unfortunately I'm not the only one on the internet and I've been fighting for my screen name everywhere. <sighs> um, so you get down to the very bottom of the list and there are still a set of options and you have to identify which one it is. And that's actually what you do in traversing a non-deterministic finite automata. It has something known as a transition function. So you would start at the very beginning at that slash, and then you would say, I have been given a character. What is this character? That character is a U. Oh, okay, so that means that my options are on line two, that U, or on line one, that U. And I've completely eliminated an entire subtree down here on the bottom on line four. 
I don't have to check it anymore. Now the next character I get is an S. And I say, ooh, I've got one. But also, maybe the, you're not done. And so you feed the next character into the transition function, which is going to be passed into a whole bunch of states. So this S on each of lines one and two uh, actually would receive a, here's my next character. My next character is a E. And route two goes home sad. Um, and then we continue all the way through this process and eventually you get slash users slash new and it says, hey, I've got one for you. Congratulations, you found a match. Now, back to our crime drama. Uh, that symbol there looks like a three backward uh, is an epsilon. And that is known as an epsilon move. What happens when I actually have uh, a route that doesn't consume a character? Wait a minute, what are you talking about? Nathan, that doesn't make any sense. Why would I have a route that doesn't have a, anything in the actual URL? That doesn't, what? So it turns out uh, you use that feature every single day. How many of you use index.html? How many of you have it appear in your URLs? You never want that thing to appear. It's just unnecessary noise. How did you know, though, to go from nothing to index.html? And the answer is actually an epsilon move. And so an epsilon move inside of an NFA says, I'm in this current state presently, and what I want to do is I want to move to this state without consuming any character off of the input. So what happens is when you pass in a uh, transition function, the next states always traverse to the very, very end of every single epsilon chain. So I say, hey, give me all of the things that I could get to if I didn't consume any additional characters. And then after that, here's my other character. Is that still valid at the end of any of those? So that's kind of the real big magic inside of a non-deterministic finite automata. So let's imagine trying to build a route recognizer on top of an NFA. We have this thing called uh, Dynamic segments. Hmm, there's this weird new something here. What are you doing, Nathan? Uh, this is actually a loop. So a radix tree has this one problem. You get down to the very end of it and you finish looking it up. Every now and then though, if you get the fun like mid 90s uh, phone books, you'll get all the way down to like uh, Bruce Wayne and it'll say, C, Batman. And you go to Batman, and you look it up, and you says, C, Bruce Wayne. And you've got an infinite loop there. And that is a real big problem inside of a actual tree structure. Uh, because once you have a cycle, you never, you never know when to stop. Well, in an NFA, you actually are consuming the input as you go. So that means that you can stop whenever you run out of characters. So you are guaranteed to terminate. So because you are guaranteed to terminate, you can do little things like this. Uh, so let's say I wanted to support dynamic segments. What I've done is I've drawn a circle back to the same node. So uh, you've seen the named transition, you've seen the epsilon transition. I can also have a loop and it goes directly back to that same node and it says, as long as I'm not a slash, I'm going to keep eating like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, and then the other neat trick is way down here at the very bottom, you can see a globbing segment. And that is actually, a, again, a regular expression, and it loops back to itself and it just keeps consuming. So what this has done is created this really neat trick here, but it's expensive. It turns out that for LinkedIn, we have a giant application with 500 routes in it, and 500 routes generates about a 60 megabyte NFA. That's not acceptable. How much RAM does your device have? 
not enough, especially when your browser inside of it doesn't get full access to it. So generating a 60, my, 60 megabyte NFA is pretty much a non-starter for mobile web applications. I know what we can do. We can compress this. If we look at this, there's a lot of duplication here. So here's a compressed version of a NFA. And what we've done is we've collapsed all of the things that looked the same and added a feature known as an accepting state. So if we look at that S in user, you remember that there was a route called us and I can say, hey, I can stop here. Or I can keep going, whatever. Whatever makes sense. So knowing that you can actually stop at any particular node is now a way that we can optimize this. But uh, we got a problem. What happens if I stop on this S? Which route am I at? I'm at both of them. Awesome. That's not good enough. So unfortunately, we have to duplicate things. Anytime we have a accepting state that would collide, we need to guarantee unique accepting states. So we end up exploding this back out and all of those performance benefits from here have mostly evaporated. That's not good. So now we've got all of these problems here and what we've run into is we're too slow, we're too big, we're too all of these things, and we really just need a better solution. So we're going to take a mild detour, um, and for those of you whose eyes haven't been checked recently, we're going to get there, I promise. Uh, which, what do you see? Is that a W? Is that an E? Um, I'm going to need you to read line three from left to right. Uh, and uh, so what we need is rules for resolving ambiguous URLs. Ambiguous URLs like slash us and this one here, which this is the underlying uh, DSL, domain specific language, uh, inside of route recognizer, which says, hey, we have me, we have mess, uh, we have messaging, we have me with any random parameter that I can pass to it. And then I also have this other route called messaging. Care to guess which one of these would actually be matched by line 10 here? Yeah, I don't know. In fact, that's an implementation detail that nobody should actually ever have to figure out because that's a real big pain. So this is a complete mess, and what we really want is a better way to specify our constraints. So we need to say, here's what we can do for uh, building a URL. We want all route segments to begin and end with a slash, which means that we don't end up with this situation where we have so many collisions for like me and mess and messaging. Um, we match based upon specificity as opposed to definition order. So in this one, actually, the very first one to match will be number four, if we matched in definition order from top to bottom. And so we'd stop there. Um, but we could use, how many of you write CSS? So if you actually used CSS selector rules, you could say a static segment is more specific than a dynamic segment, which is more specific than a glob segment, which is more specific than an epsilon segment. Um, so each of these things is more, in, or excuse me, less and less specific. So there's one other interesting constraint when you're actually building a route recognizer type library, and that is that your deserializer must affirmatively eliminate every single node. I can't just prune a tree because this one particular character doesn't match. I actually have to traverse all the way until I know that that node is for sure not going to match. So, on line four, can you please read the... Uh, so, we also need to add support for arbitrarily complex path segments. So it turns out the 
DSL that we support for a route recognition library may allow us to pass in multiple things at the same time. So on line seven and on line two, three, and four, we can see that we've ended up creating something that would map to the same thing. That's not very good. So now how do I know that company account ID config string is different from company company ID SEO junk? Uh, and which one do I actually end up with? So we need even more constraints. And so those more constraints look like this. So we're gonna count the number of segments. So in this case, the number of segments for each of these is three. And three is the number of segments. Uh, after we have counted the segments, if multiple routes still match, then our next tiebreaker is segment weighting. So if we look at these segments in order, we have a static, and then a dynamic, and then a glob. And we count all of them individually. How many of you know that if you specify 256 classes in CSS that you can override an ID? You can totally do that. And does anybody have any idea why? 8-bit integers. So if you have an 8-bit integer, you may represent 255 unique numbers. If you hit 256, it overflows. Well, turns out the specificity in every single browser engine for CSS at some point in time was just a series of 8-bit integers all slammed right next to each other. So you could overflow from the class definition into the ID uh, specificity area. So we can use that similar situation where we separate all of them out and we count them individually. So in this case, we'll count all of the dynamic segments, we'll count all of the uh, static segments, and we'll count all of the glob segments separately, and then come up with a specificity score at the very end. If the score is still the same, the number of handlers is the next uh, differentiator. So if we look at lines two, three, and four, and line seven, each of these handlers are actually specified by the dot two. So we can see that on line four, we have three handlers, and the number of handlers is three. And then on line seven, we have just one handler. And so now we've identified which route we are going to actually use. And so we're going to use the one on line four. So, and then all other things being equal, uh, let's say you happen to define the same route twice, uh, we choose the very first one. You thought we might be done. <laughs> We're close. Uh, so not only is all of this a thing, it must be fast. So turns out we are shipping a parser and generator down to the client every time we actually ship route recognizer. And that's a terrible situation to be in. So we don't want to generate the parser on the end client. We actually want to even generate that parser server side and ship it to the client all at once. Maybe we generate it at build time. And so it has to be fast. And so this is actually the new serialized format for route recognizer. And all it is is a radix tree which we traverse using a transition function. And all it is is like, hey, if you look at this, this is application, it has an ID. And then if you look down here somewhere, somewhere, oh, it's okay. So we can see here's one that says parent, and then it says ID six. There's another that says parent, and it says ID one. And so what we've done is we've serialized a, a tree into a set of JSON. And so now all of our parser is just JSON parse this and then pass it into a very small function. And so instead of it requiring generating a 60 megabyte in memory object, this comes out to about 100 kilobytes. And it's way faster um, and it's way better. Now, uh, this is the Ember portion of the presentation. Um, I would 
really, really hate to disappoint Tom. So, uh, it turns out, if you want to use this today, all you have to do is type Ember install uh, Ember route recognizer inside of your console if you're running an Ember application. If you're not running an Ember application, you can actually use a node installation and everything else uh, will still continue to work. I'm going to, and Heather's actually in the process of doing that right now. Um, and so our goals are to eventually remove this from the core Ember build and have this be an add-on or have this be a library that anybody can consume. It's presently used by Ember. I believe it's used by some variations of routers inside of the React and Angular communities as well. Um, and this is the kind of thing that everybody can use and it's actually not a terribly complicated problem to solve, but it's definitely a lot more complicated than, I'm just gonna throw a stack of regular expressions at it. And so with that, uh, this jerk uh, just talked at you for a half hour. Um, and I, if you, um, you probably can't see that, they're behind the couch. All of my information is in this bottom right hand corner. Um, so what's really happening is don't get in touch with me. I did not want to talk to you and you didn't want to talk to me either. Uh, so I work at LinkedIn, we are always hiring. Uh, not only are we always hiring, uh, we're very interested to talk to all of you. And so if you want to talk about living in San Francisco, uh, where it is uh, probably about 50 degrees right now, um, <laughs> I'm selling it really well, aren't I? Uh, and the uh, surfing is terrible. And uh, But if you still are interested after both of those things, uh, come talk to me afterward and I'll uh, give you our elevator pitch and then I'll give you my knuckleball and then I'll give you... Is it expensive? It is very expensive to live in San Francisco. But it's all right. Link that part's fine. LinkedIn's got you covered. <laughs> All right, and with that, uh, questions? No That's question. way back in the corner. So, uh, on the exact same day, I posted a 5,000 word essay on all of this. In fact, if you want to read it, nathanhammond.com slash route-recognizer, it goes into way more detail than this. Um, and so if you want your eyes to bleed in addition to your ears, um, <laughs> you can actually dive in. On the same day, uh, somebody else whose name I've forgotten. Uh, it's not it's wow, I sound like a total jerk. Uh, posted a, you might not need uh, a router uh, describing a React-based approach for doing this. And so it's about a, um, it's about a thousand word essay on here are all the things that you end up needing to do to build a simplistic recognizer for something like React. Well, it turns out all of that code ends up being larger than this implementation. Um, it's not as cohesive in terms of its uh, working together, it doesn't have as clean of a plan. And so in my estimation, actually adopting and approaching this from the computer science fundamentals gives you a much better foundation on which to stand. And this whole implementation is actually less than a thousand lines of code. Um, so it seems really complicated and intimidating, but it's actually just one data structure and one transition function, and a little bit of supporting code to make sure that you don't paint yourself into a corner. So there are other options. I don't believe that many of them make a lot of sense. In fact, I believe some of them make negative sense. <laughs> yes? Why did you solve this problem? <laughs> because I have a tremendously high tolerance for pain. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is that a good enough answer? 